Hello, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back uh, to this panel number five on settlers and agriculture. Today we're going to have three speakers, Peter Lavelle from Temple University who will join us online and talk about overseas labor migration and the Chinese colonial imagination. Um, Professor Martin Dusenberg from the University of Zurich, whose paper is about reconciling Japanese indigenous histories in the imperial Pacific world. And Mona Bieling, who is a PhD student here at the Institute and who will talk about Hebrew's univer Hebrew University's botanical gardens, a source in scientific knowledge creation in mandatory Palestine. Um, I have a reputation for being very strict about time. <laughs> we'll see how that goes today. <laughs> so um, I think Peter should come on any moment now. And I leave the floor to him. Thanks. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Let me start off by offering special thanks to Cyrus and David for all of their work in making this conference possible. Um, I regret that I cannot be there with you in Geneva today. I'd very much like to do that, but um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to participate remotely. My paper today examines elite Chinese views of overseas Chinese migration from the 1870s up to the earliest years of the 20th century. What I found is that when overseas migration surged in the later decades of the 19th century, some Chinese elites began to valorize migrant workers for the potential to aid in the colonization of the Qing Empire's borderland territories. They proposed that efforts should be made to redirect the flow of migrants away from overseas destinations and towards the Qing Empire's frontier territories. Using pub published sources, um, namely newspaper articles in Shanghai, I've shown that this new valorization emerged from a particu particular conjunction of forces unique to the late 19th century. First, large numbers of Chinese migrants uh, started to travel overseas to uh, make money or simply find subsistence work. They often found work in natural resource industries like agriculture and mining, uh, or in things like infrastructure building, uh, namely railroad construction. Second, there was a growing awareness among government officials and literati in China about the abuses, violence, and discrimination these migrant workers faced when they went overseas. Third, Qing territory was increasingly threatened, if not, if not totally annexed, um, by foreign powers. This caused, of course, serious alarm among the country's political elites. Uh, and fourth, Chinese leaders faced, uh, felt a new urgency to exploit the country's resources to bolster power of the imperial state in the face of internal and external adversaries. My interest in this topic stems from my desire to explore new ways of thinking about the Qing Empire as a colonial empire in the decades before its political demise in 1911. Needless to say, the Qing Empire remained a, an empire in these decades, but the story of the Qing as a colonial empire in this period has often been overshadowed by the larger story of the Qing as a colonial frontier for the expansion of other empires, namely European, American, and Japanese empires. For quite a long time, considerations of the subordinate position of the Qing in the wider imperial world set the parameters and the terms for historical investigations of imperialism and colonialism in modern China. This influenced the work of historians in many ways. For example, they tended to explore places where Europeans operated most commonly, especially coastal regions, uh, and they tended to investigate technologies that were introduced uh, to China by Europeans, thus uh, uh, not really focusing on, uh, for example, native technologies or native formations of colonial rule, especially in the heyday of foreign imperialism. Especially since the 1990s, I think, scholars have taken many important steps 
to move away from old models of Chinese history that juxtaposed China and the West. More and more work has explored the dynamics of Qing imperialism across Eastern Eurasia in the century and a half before the Opium Wars. Still, Qing and Chinese patterns of colonialism in the late 19th century remain relatively unexplored, perhaps because those patterns seem so different and unrelated to what I think remains the kind of what remains the quintessential manifestation of imperialism in China in the eyes of historians, and that is uh, foreign gunboat uh, imperialism in the treaty ports. So my analysis of elite discourses around overseas migration is partially an attempt to understand how Chinese elites themselves thought about the prospects for uh, Chinese colonialism in frontier territories. In this approach, my method is not to privilege particular definitions of imperialism uh, and colonialism at the outset. Rather, I have paid attention to the comparisons offered by Chinese literati themselves because these comparisons offer important clues about visions and justifications for a homegrown colonial project. This homegrown colonial project was premised on the assumption that the outer territories of the Qing Empire, which encompassed Taiwan, Manchuria, Mongolia, East Turkestan, and Tibet, were always already part of China, Chinese territory, but which were threatened internally and externally. It was also premised upon the assumption that in order to secure such places for the once and future Chinese nation, it would be necessary to colonize them with Han Chinese settlers, primarily farmers, uh, and thereby create new Chinas in those places. Although it is certainly true that the indigenous inhabitants of these territories were subjected to various versions of and formations of colonial rule that aimed to assimilate them to Chinese norms. In general, in metropolitan Chinese discourse in the late 19th century, these peoples were all but excluded from discussion, uh, simply erased from the page um, and erased in the minds of most um, Chinese elites. For Chinese elites in the metropole then, land settlement and the development of resource territories, uh, resource industries was more important um, to securing territory in the long term than any particular policy pertaining uh, to uh, the acculturation of, um, of indigenous inhabitants. But of course, uh, land dispossession was, was a, a, a key uh, policy in this regard. My concern with homegrown formations of Chinese colonialism in the late Qing period does not mean, of course, that foreign empires had no role to play in influencing Chinese discourses about colonial settlement in the Qing territories. What I am most interested in exploring is the way in which Chinese elites understood and justified colonial practices within their own empire by way of reference to the activities of land settlement, resource extraction, and, and so on in other imperial countries with their own colonial frontiers. The articles and essays I've read suggest that some Chinese elites maintained a keen fascination with frontier colonization as a way to revive a long lost Chinese imperial glory. And so some of these uh, writings are replete with numerous references and allusions to Chinese history uh, going back uh, 2,000 or more years. At the same time, other writers saw colonial sell settlement primarily as a manifestation of their country's determination and gumption uh, to keep up with, that is to say, compete with their imperial, imperial rivals. Unsurprisingly, this desire to compete with other empires sometimes led Chinese elites to make comparisons that implicitly or explicitly presented Chinese patterns of settlement in the Qing Empire's outer territories as analogs to colonial development in other parts of the world. Especially around the turn of the 20th century, Chinese writers looked overseas to foreign examples of colonialism to articulate their own countries, uh, th their country's own patterns of rule. For example, some authors explained the empire's control of eastern Turkestan, or, or Xinjiang as it's called in Chinese, by way of 
comparisons with Japanese rule over Hokkaido and U.S. rule over the Philippines. They also compared other parts of the Qing Empire to other European colonial territories elsewhere. In the late 19th century discourse about overseas Chinese migration, the comparisons are not nearly as explicit. In other words, they don't say uh, X overseas territory is like our Inner Mongolia or like our Manchuria. Uh, still, by suggesting that Chinese labor could be beneficial to projects of uh, colonial settlement or resource extraction, regardless of whether they were in Mexico or in Xinjiang, this discourse implied a certain commensurability in strategies and justifications for colonialism in borderland areas. Chinese writers seemed to be fond of imagining how people who might otherwise end up working in slavish conditions in Cuba or be subjected to harassment and violence in California could instead go to Taiwan, Manchuria, Mongolia, or Eastern Turkestan and find better and more fruitful lives for themselves. It was imagined that in those places they would be able to do essentially the same things they would have done if they had gone overseas or if they uh, were convinced to uh, return from overseas destinations. In particular, write writers imagine migrants becoming farmers, grow growing cash crops, or uh, miners digging for gold. According to this discourse, if Chinese migrants were sent to Qing borderlands rather than to overseas destinations, the only difference would be that they would be working to benefit the development of their home country rather than foreign countries, and that they would be sheltered from the mistreatment and the prejudice of foreigners. It bears mentioning that Chinese writers, or at least the ones I've explored in my very short essay, uh, were not at all concerned with questions about economic formations or systems that structured the lives of Chinese migrant workers and, uh, of course, many other migrant workers around the world at this time. That is to say, they left out important details and thus downplayed crucial differences between what happened on, for example, a sugar plantation in Cuba versus an in individual farm homestead in Manchuria. This does not mean, of course, that historians should neglect questions about economic formations in de deciding how to characterize patterns of imperialism and colonialism. But it is a useful reminder that attention to economic forms and stagist approaches to history, which became more common among uh, intellectuals, including Chinese intellectuals, in the early 20th century, cannot fully capture the trans-imperial dynamics and logics of empire making in the late 19th century. Finally, let me turn to the question of co-production of empires. In my paper, I cite a recent article by two sinologists who have analyzed 20th century discussions of imperialism in modern Chinese history, uh, and 21st, I should say, uh, recent discussions of imperialism in modern Chinese history. They conclude that historians should understand empire as a conceptual co-production. They mean, I think, that we historians would do well to consider how meanings of empire emerge when we try to sort out the diverse and divergent, but sometimes partially overlapping, dynamics and historical experiences of people who lived in and around empires. Taking this one step further, we should think about the conceptual co-production of empire, not just among historians, but also among the people we study as well. It seems to me that in, in their attempt to posit a certain degree of commensuration in the economic function of Chinese migrants, wherever they happen to be, Chinese literati were revealing their willingness to think about colonial settlement, not just comparatively, but uh, as a crucial practice of all modern countries. Their vision for Chinese uh, colonialism within the Qing Empire was premised on the inter-imperial movement of Chinese workers and on an understanding of how those workers were put, were put to work in other empires. And so assessing the inter-imperial connections between China and the world is, I think, a crucial step in understanding homegrown colonialism in China. Thank you.
Good. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and good morning, Peter. Very sorry not to uh, see you in person here today. Uh, thanks for your paper. Um, as, as with the other speakers, of course, today, I'd like to thank uh, Cyrus and David uh, for the wonderful uh, organization of this conference and, of course, the Pierre de, de, de Bois uh, Foundation for generous support and also my fellow panelists whose papers I've greatly enjoyed reading. Um, so. Um, I thought I would today um, give a sort of uh, very brief explanation of the wider book project from which this paper comes, uh, which hopefully will be of interest to those of you who have read the paper, and for those of you who haven't, will allow you to pretend that you have. <laughs> um, and as with all book projects, I begin from the gap between what I intended to do and what I ended up doing. Uh, this is the gap in which dreams are made and, and broken. Um, so, uh, sorry, that was an unexpectedly profound comment for 11, 11 15 in, uh, in the morning, but it is Friday the 13th today, so hey. Um, okay, so uh, what I intended to do with this project um, was um, going out of an interest that I had in uh, microhistory. And here I, I will speak of microhistory without the sort of popular global adjective that often goes in front of it these days. But an interest in microhistory is a methodology for disarming uh, nation state narratives. Uh, that was one interest. Um, and then an interest that had grown out of my PhD work on uh, trans Pacific Japanese uh, migration and the idea that perhaps one could tell a story of Japan's uh, engagement with the Pacific world through a microhistory, in this case, by following the story of a single steamship across its 20-year uh, career, um, in order to sort of think about what was the nature of Japan's, uh, major Japan's uh, engagements with the outside world uh, in the uh, 1880s and 1890s in particular, and to think of those engagements, particularly with a focus on labor, uh, rather than on elite students and intellectuals and so on, uh, whose um, writings still dominate uh, the imagination of Meiji Japan as a global power. Um, this also I knew would bring me into dialogue with new work on imperialism and sort of building on what Louise Young said yesterday in her keynote uh, speech. I mean, this is, I think, another key uh, change in the historiography of modern Japan is particularly in new work in the last two or three years, uh, the idea uh, that labor migrants were also in some ways foot, foot soldiers of Japanese expansionism, um, even if not to the formal uh, colonies of the Japanese empire. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And then finally, a sort of another intention I had was to try and uh, bring in a global history approach, by which I mean here the bringing together of different historiographies. Uh, it seems to me this is one of the richest uh, ways uh, in which global history can help us rethink um, the history of the past. So in this case, uh, the historiography of rural poverty in late 19th century Japan with a historiography of uh, what is called the dismembering of the Hawaiian nation, the Lahui, at the end of the 19th century, uh, with the eventual, with first the coup and then the eventual uh, annexation. And equally, at the same time, all of that also with the historiography of uh, federation in Australia in the 1890s and, and early 1900s. Uh, in other words, this had to be a trans-imperial story because the ship I was following was going between different empires, the Japanese Empire, the British Empire, the US Empire, um, and as I'm sort of beginning to get onto in, in new research, also German uh, colonies in the Pacific. So that was what I intended to do. What I did was, I did sort of write that story, uh, but I was deeply satis dissatisfied with how I wrote it, um, and sort of one Actually, turning point for me came here in this building in November 2013 when I gave a presentation. I think some of the people who were there that day uh, were are online today, um, where I just got off the boat from archival research in uh, Brisbane um, and also in, in Tokyo. And so I gave a paper which was about the relationship between Japanese expansionism through labor migration and Australian Federation. And everyone in the audience politely nodded and tried not to nod off. Um, and um, in, in the reaction uh, and in my own sort of reflections on it, I realized slowly that the um, very framework of multi-archival research which I was advocating 
as a methodology was in fact reproducing and exacerbating certain silences both within the archives and between the archives. And this is an aspect of the inter or the trans, which I feel like we should be discussing more um, because it also raises a question that hasn't really been raised thus far, which is what constitutes a colonial archive in trans imperial history and where do we go looking for it? So in some ways, the whole book is therefore actually a mea culpa. It's a set of reflections on what I missed in my initial archival reconstructions of a Japanese ship and its history. And then of what those misses and my subsequent attempted corrections might tell us about the oft overlooked problem uh, in global history, namely practices of archival reconstruction. So this takes me to the two case studies in the paper, um, both of which work within the wider context of trans-Pacific labor migration and sugarcane sugar production, and therefore speak to this panel's focus on settlers and agriculture. Um, but here I'm going to define imperial quite tightly. Um, what I'm doing in the paper is trying to fold together collections in, on the one hand, Tokyo, and on the other hand, this tiny town in the west of Japan, Kamenoseki, with those of um, British and US imperialism in Queensland and in the Hawaiian archipelago, respectively. And what I'm trying to do is to make an argument that historians of Japan, in this case, need to pay much greater attention than they previously have to indigenous contexts in our reading of Japanese settler practices across the uh, Asia Pacific world. I'm not going to go into detail on either of the cases. You can read about them. Um, but what I'll just sort of overview quickly um, are the conclusions that I come to from these two case studies. Um, the first was an example from uh, the Japan Australia axis, as it were, uh, from around 1900. Um, and the conclusion was that um, as Japanese bureaucrats and expansionist ideologues imagined new sites of Japanese migrant expansion, they imagined northern Queensland as empty. Um, and therefore, the diplomatic relations, which are today stored in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs diplomatic archives, were actually based on a set of colonial assumptions from the British about First Nation Aboriginal peoples, namely that they didn't exist in this part of the world and that the land wasn't theirs. And therefore, what we were seeing in the Japanese archive was a co-production of colonial imaginations and silences about, in this case, Aboriginal peoples in Northern Queensland. The second example was from the Japan-Hawaii story, uh, and it spanned the period in which this particular migrant I was interested in left Japan in 1889, um, and the remittances that he made to his hometown in the early 1910s. And this is a more complex story I, I go into in a bit more detail in the paper, but it boils down to this set of questions, namely, what did Japanese plantation work look like from the perspective of those native Hawaiians who had been deprived of their land by the plantation owners for whom the Japanese now toiled. In other words, to what extent were Japanese laborers colluding in Euro-American settler colonialism in Hawaii? And this takes us into the broader literature of what's been called Asian settler colonialism in Hawaii. But I wanted to then take that Asian settler colonialism framework one step further and ask how might one measure that collusion between the Japanese and the plantation managers and owners for whom they worked. And one level I suggested in the paper was through recruitment, the encouragement which some Japanese migrants made to other Japanese migrants to come make money in Hawaii. And the second was to do with land acquisition in Japan through 
remittance payments, right? So you, you made your money on the plantations, you sent the money home, and eventually when you'd saved enough money, you bought land in your hometown, sometimes you bought two or three houses, and you really made yourself. Um, and I argue in the paper and in the book that these should be considered the same side of the coin, as it were, with stories of land dispossession in Hawaii. In other words, to sort of extend the Patrick Wolfe framework of settler colonialism, it seems to me that land dispossession is a story which must go beyond the contours of an individual colonial state. In other words, just to conclude, um, there are, I think, two more C's which we should be talking about today. Just go back to the language for those of you who online have no idea what I'm talking about. This, the, the idea that we should be thinking in, in words that begin with C came up. Um, one is co-productions, uh, which is, of course, central to Peter's paper, I should say. Peter, Peter I was also part of the team that, that Lee Jenko and, and John Chappell developed that work in, and, and we can maybe talk about that as a framework uh, more broadly. So one is co-productions and the other is collusions. Um, and I, I would like to sort of think about how we, we use these terms both empirically and epistemologically. What does that mean for our practices in the archives? So uh, just a, a final quick comment, um, or, or two sentences, if I may. Uh, in the paper, I gave a rather garbled example of uh, this co-production collusion uh, uh, nexus with my sort of very brief uh, and inadequate focus on the term industrious. Um, but I actually, as a sort of potential side project to all of this, see there's quite a lot of uh, scope for a trans-imperial history of discourses of industriousness that for example, in the Japanese case, thinks about the ways in which this Lockean terminology entered Hokkaido through the US frontier, also equally through um, Japanese sugar um, agronomists who were trained in Germany, and as I suggested in the paper, also through Japanese labor encounters with uh, the plantation system in Hawaii. And, this, this language of remittances as industrious money in Japanese term that is, is very unusual. Um, so I sort of wonder, I put this out as an idea, is this something that we could sort of think about uh, together as a project? And, and I, plead, ask, I make a plea for help, you know, if, if anyone could uh, think about how, we, how this could be done. And of course, it draws on the longer history of this term kimben in, in, in the sinosphere, which, which translates roughly into industriousness. Um, and the, the final point is, is just to say that um, I think this conference, these types of gatherings are a wonderful chance to sort of talk across our different expertise, our different area expertise in particular. But I think it also comes with a kind of danger, um, which is that we, we, we think of other areas, right? I know a bit about Japan, I know a bit about Australia, I think now a bit more about Russia, about the Ottoman Empire, um, etc. And that's great, but I would love us also to think with and um, I've suggested in this paper ways in which we might think with Japan about these issues of colonialism and indigenous uh, people relationships. But I'm sure there are other examples from your expertise, and, and I look forward to hearing more about them. Thank you very much. There should be a PowerPoint just in a minute, but I can start uh, without my first slide, I think. Um, so also for me, thank you, Cyrus, for having me. Uh, thank you, David, for all of your work. I sit next to you. I know how much this took you for the, you know, the last couple of weeks, so thank you so much. Uh, and Irina Dubois and the Dubois Foundation, not just for this conference, but everything you do for the department and for the students, um, thank you. Thank you very much. And to everyone for coming and engaging with our work. I'm, I'm really happy to share this with you. All right, so I want to talk to about, about the Hebrew University's uh, botanical gardens and the trans-imperial connections and absences that are connected to um, this history. Uh, this is part of my PhD dissertation in which I analyze several different forms of landscape changes during the British mandate um, for Palestine. I examine how these landscape changes influenced the power relationships uh, between the British, the Zionist movement, and the local Arab-Palestinian population. <clears throat> 
And in this context, I discuss the history of the botan botanical gardens of the Hebrew University as one of my chapters. I make uh, five connected arguments in my chapter, and three of them, I think, um, relate really well to um, this conference. So today, I would like to give you a brief overview of the history of the gardens, and then also work out the trans-imperial and other trans-spatial um, dimensions that are connected to the gardens. So um, the Bot Botanical Gardens was established in 1931 by the two Jewish botanists, Otto Warburg and Alexander Eich. And here on this uh, PowerPoint, I'll see if I can go there and show you quickly where it is. <laughs> um, the Botanical Gardens are found over there, um, right hand side underneath the main road. Uh, I would like to thank my colleague Ahmad for pointing this out uh, to me. So the garden was connected to the Department of Botany at the Hebrew University and was supposed to serve its students in the practical part of their studies. Both founders, uh, Warburg and Eich, placed emphasis on a, a scientific direction of the garden um, as opposed to, um, for example, having mainly ornamental or also uh, religious functions. At the time, the Hebrew University was still in its infancy, having been inaugurated only a few years prior in 1925. Both the university and its departments were under relative financial strain and lacking adequate faculty. One of my arguments is that prioritizing the establishment of a botanical garden shows uh, that botany played a significant role in the Jewish efforts to build a homeland in Palestine. As I show in my chapter, botany in general, and the garden in particular, helped the Zionists in their effort to build a Jewish state in Palestine by demarcating the borders of that future state and making a knowledge claim about the space uh, falling into these borders. The establishment of the Department of Botany and the corresponding garden was a culmination of several previous efforts of institutionalizing the study of botany in Palestine. And these efforts had been started already in the early 1900s uh, by agronomists and botanists, and among them is Otto Warburg, who established the Agricultural Experiment Station, um, several actually, but most importantly the one Rehovot. <coughs> I apologize, I have a frog in my throat today. <clears throat> so this experiment station was tasked uh, with carrying out experiments and research on topics such as botany, agriculture, and horticulture, and other areas that were supposed to contribute to the improvement of uh, agricultural practices in Palestine, which, with the goal to facilitate Jewish settlement and make increased Jewish settlement there possible. Uh, and this research related, for example, to citrus uh, cult uh, cultivation, the increased yield of grains, pest control, uh, and other related issues. A similar spirit of working towards increased Jewish settlement and ultimately Jewish nationhood in Palestine was, I argue, carried over into Hebrew University's Department of Botany and the Botanical Garden, as I think, or I hope, <laughs> will become clearer throughout my talk. So today I would like to talk about uh, three trans-imperial connections um, that I see. First is Otto Warburg's connection with Germany, and here I'm making an argument about technocracy. Um, secondly, the mobility of Warburg's fellow botanists. I'm looking at a community of uh, five people here. And here I'm making an argument about uh, boundary making in a regional, uh, regional framework. And then lastly, the relative absence of the British Empire throughout um, this story. <coughs> so the co-founder of the garden was uh, Otto Warburg, whom you can see here. Um, he um, was active in the process of institutionalizing Jewish agricultural and botanical studies in Palestine. He was born in Germany and received his education both in Germany and France. And then he worked as an advisor for the German colonial services in southern and southeastern Asia uh, from 1885 to 1889, where he became an expert on tropical botany and he collected a wide array of uh, specimens as well, which he brought back uh, with him to Germany. Back in Germany, he continued to be active for um, German colonial endeavors. He worked for um, German plantation societies, for example, in Cameroon and Togoland. And he also founded the journal uh, Der Tropenpflanzer, or um, The Tropical Planter, which uh, specialized in tropical agriculture and was published widely, um, and was published, uh, no, published widely on colonial agricultural development. He was also an active member in the German Colonial Economic Committee, the Kolonialwirtschaftliches Komitee, of which Der Tropenpflanzer was the main uh, publication. 
And I think we can see a nice connection here with uh, Moritz von Brescu's paper from yesterday, because he, in his paper he mentioned Der Tropenpflanzer is one of the um, important journals and outlets for, for example, the news on rubber um, plantations. So it was only after all this activity for the German colonial efforts that Warburg was introduced to Zionist circles in Europe whose ranks he then climbed quite quickly until he became the president of the Zionist organization in 1911. He held the post of president uh, for 10 years until 1921, which coincided with his move to Palestine and the start of his activities there. Warburg introduced certain aspects characteristic for the German empire into his work for the World Zionist Organization. Most significantly, and I'm quoting uh, Derek Penzler here, the German colonial services unique commitment to scientific research and development, end quote. In Palestine, Warburg's personal background and his experience in the German colonial system contributed to his commitment to university education as opposed to more practical agricultural work. And according to Penzler again, um, Warburg was the scientist who was most influential in introducing the importance of scientific expertise into the establishment of a Jewish national home. Warburg's conviction on the importance of experts' knowledge in colonial development that stemmed from his work for the German Empire was thus carried over into his activities in Palestine and shaped his work there in important ways. Uh, and in this context, I argue that the Botanical Garden was part of a scientific, technocratic vision of Palestine, which was influenced by Warburg's experience in and work for the German Empire. Uh, and I think this point connects quite nicely to the discussion on technocrats we had yesterday and which we can maybe uh, expand on a little bit. Um, so the second connection I see is um, related to the background, the mobility, and the spatial reference points that the other botanists, Warburg's colleagues, uh, held. Warburg was not the only one of the Jewish botanists to experience mobility across empires. Uh, and here I was reminded um, of Mark Palin's comment yesterday about uh, Friedrich Liss living in France and prior life. And I think for some of these, individuals I look at, this also applies. So when we look at his colleagues at the Department of Botany, we see that three stages of mobility were important for this group. Their education in Europe before immigration to Palestine, then the actual decision to move to Palestine, and the travels that the botanists undertook for the research once uh, they were settled in Palestine. And all of these travels combined provided the canon of knowledge on which the botanists then built their work. In Europe, I just want to point out very briefly that uh, three of the five were born in the Russian Empire and one in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and all of them received their early education in Europe before immigrating to Palestine in their um, beginning to uh, early to mid-20s. In Palestine itself, um, the botanists conducted extensive travels in relation with their botanical studies. I want to uh, point out Naomi feinborn Dotan, who can, you can see on the slide over here, um, who was also the only uh, female colleague of Warburg. And she had... Uh, Honestly, the most impressive uh, um, research itinerary. Um, she traveled throughout the Middle East and Europe and also had a brief visit to our own uh, herbarium here in Geneva, which is just uh, across the road. I would like to focus on uh, Alexander Eich today, who um, was the co-founder of the garden, because I think that his, um, his spatial understanding and his idea of, of regionalism um, connects quite nicely to the story. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, he was Warburg's closest colleague and the co-founder of the garden, and he mostly worked on the flora of Palestine. To carry out his studies, Ike traveled throughout the region, including uh, Turkey, France mandated uh, Syria and Lebanon, and uh, other countries in the area. I think it's quite interesting to look at um, his spatial understanding a little closer, and to see where he placed the Jerusalem garden, in, and where he, he thought that the garden would add relevance in this context. Um, he drew up a very decidedly Middle Eastern context, as opposed to, we might expect, an imperial British or uh, even a, a trans-imperial European context, considering the botanist's background. Ike, however, claimed that the garden was the only truly scientific institution of its kind, and I quote, from Turkestan and Caucasus up to the north of French Africa on the whole vast area which includes the greatest part of the Oriental flora zone, end quote. He also compared the garden to the ones of Cairo, Alexandria, and Beirut, but of course the one in Jerusalem um, was more scientific and thus better. So I say that Ike, uh, in this way of phrasing things, he kind of drew up a mental map in which the garden was situated, which uh, encompassed what today we might call the Middle East, with Jerusalem at its center. 
This conception of Ike as seeing the garden as a regional Middle Eastern center, I think is another axis in the transspatial connections running through the history of the gardens. And to sum up this point, uh, my sources show that the Jewish founders understood the garden as a regional Middle Eastern botanical hub and as a source of legitimacy, even prestige for the Zionist endeavor. And uh, I'll come to my last point. Um, one trans connection that I think was remarkable in its relative absence, namely the connections to the British Empire. As a mandated territory, Palestine was part of the British Empire at the time, but the empire seems to have functioned here just as a backdrop to the events. And to illustrate this point, I'm comparing the Jerusalem Garden to the Botanical Gardens at uh, Kew, London. The garden in Jerusalem had a quite different relation with the gardens at Kew than might have been expected. Uh, the garden at Kew had been the botanical center of the British Empire for a few hundred years at that point. And over here, I'm showing a modern picture of the temperate house at Kew, just to show anyone who's not really familiar with the place how big of an enterprise this was. Kew had also established so-called um, satellite gardens or botanical outposts in its colonies that it cooperated with closely, for example, by exchanging knowledge and specimen or by sending London trained botanists to these outposts. One can see certain parallels between the Kew and Jerusalem gardens. For example, the botanists' goal to um, improve the land in their, in their wording um, and the garden's character as a scientific institution. The botanists that planned and built the Jerusalem garden were not directly involved in any activities at Kew, though. The functions of the Jerusalem garden were not the same as the ones uh, of Kew or the British uh, colonial gardens. The aims of the Jerusalem garden were quite specifically to support research conducted at Hebrew University and to collect and present the plants of Palestine in one space, including all the plants of the Bible. The research conducted with the help of the gardens was supposed to support Jewish settlement in Palestine and therefore did have a settler colonial dimension. However, this was focused on Palestine only and uh, not in the service of the wider British Empire. When further comparing the Jerusalem garden to British colonial gardens, such as Calcutta or Jamaica, the similarities do not extend very far. Jerusalem was not an outpost for Kew, nor did its botanists receive their education at the London Center. Exchange of specimen between the gardens probably happened. Uh, however, there is no indication in my sources that this exchange was more intense or yeah, of any other uh, heightened uh, importance than with any other uh, gardens um, uh, that did not have a metropole periphery uh, dynamic. Creating a botanical garden for Palestine was thus recognized as an important part of the Zionist project, without, however, being steered by the Mandate government or its botanical center at Kew. The independence of the Zionist movement in this regard explains the relative absence of the British Mandate government from this type of landscape change in Palestine. The Jerusalem Garden had a somewhat uh, detached relationship with the British Empire and its botanical hub in London. And this relationship makes it distinct from other colonial gardens of the British Empire that were more closely connected to Kew. Alexander Ike's aforementioned spatial understanding and his attempts to put Jerusalem on the map of a broader regional uh, Middle Eastern context further support the argument that the Jerusalem botanists understood their garden as existing in its own right. Um, and I would like to conclude with a couple of reflections and maybe points for discussion for which I don't have answers, but uh, you're all here to support, so that's good. Um, so as you have just heard, this is not a top-down analysis, but it looks at a scientific community and their mobility, their influences, and so forth. And I'm kind of struck by the role of scientific communities in trans-imperial studies, their mobility, how they navigate empires. Um, and I was wondering, and I, I mean, we just heard the, the other presentation from this morning, um, is this specific to scientific communities um, what are the aspects that are specific and which of the aspects can be transferred to other communities or groups, for example, the mercantile elites that we just heard about. Um, and in that context, I'm also really looking forward to um, the first panel of tomorrow about knowledge, and I hope we'll learn a bit more about those aspects. Um, and then just a reflection, um, I think it also becomes quite clear that the Zionist movement, at least at that stage in time, is an inherently transspatial endeavor. Um, and I'm looking mostly at a community of, of immigrants um, and its processes of knowledge creation. And lastly, um, I just wanted to um, pose the question how, uh, what the role of diasporas is in this context and how diasporas may form, shape, unsettle, disturb um, empires and inter-imperial and trans-imperial relations. <laughs>
And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, three very engaging and rich papers that raised quite a lot of methodological and conceptual issues. I see already hands going up. I'm going to start uh, taking a question uh, that was posted online. Uh, and uh, actually, it's, uh, I think, a question for Peter to begin with, or a comment, and then a question for Martin by Shelen Vu. Uh, uh, asking uh, or saying, Matt Mosca, Scott Riley, and others suggest that Qing officials and provincial officials were well informed about British Russian efforts. Are you seeing these discussions in Shanghai? That's uh, for Peter. And for Martin, you write about the silences in the archives on indigenous voices in your paper. Could you also talk a little about the silence on the gender dynamics of Japanese settler colonialism? Who wants to uh, so, as I understand it, the question is about uh, Chinese knowledge of Russian and British empires yes. in, in Shanghai. Yes, I believe there was discussion of, uh, of Russian and British imperialism uh, or uh, imperial formations without necessarily using those terms um, in the late 19th century. Uh, my work, particularly in this paper, um, uses a relatively narrow source base, so I've only been looking at some uh, Chinese language newspapers uh, in Shanghai, and those newspapers did have some coverage of, of those issues. But I, unfortunately, I, I don't think I can speak more broadly um, to the full extent of the Chinese language uh, discussions of Russian and British imperialism in Shanghai at the time. Shall I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, Shelen. Um, and sorry, we can't meet in person. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, the, I, I can maybe just speak very briefly to two aspects of the question of gender dynamics in um, Japanese settler colonialism. One is um, sort of behind the story of the individual migrant Fuyuki, which I told in the story, um, is of course um, the institution of the household and quite what adjective we should put in front of that household is, is, is a historiographical debate. Should it be called a transnational household, a transimperial household? But I think we should think of his work as part of a household unit in which um, female actors are also extremely important. His uh, desire to buy land, his desire to educate his uh, children in Japan and keep some of them in Hawaii. Uh, this is very common practice. And uh, I think those decisions were not just made by the men actors in the household unit. So I think we, we sort of need to think about actors in terms of the household institution. Um, and then there's a second element which is less so in Hawaii, but definitely in, in Southeast Asia and, and in Australia. Um, there were very significant numbers of Japanese female laborers um, in places like um, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Northern Australia. Um, they were sex laborers. Um, and as a consequence, this links back to the sort of question of archival silences because their files are not kept in the same uh, locations as the files for the male uh, plantation overseas laborers um, because the women were considered to be a law and order problem and therefore they're kept in the police files and the judicial files, uh, whereas the male migrants are kept in... Uh, the mobility files of the Japanese Empire, and therein you see a, a, a problem, right? Uh, which is the archive is already creating these female actors as problems, as transgressors, even though it's absolutely clear from their personal testimony that they left Japan for exactly the same reason as the men left Japan, namely they were poor. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I've had, I have serious, I have quite a lot of questions already. Serious, Michael, a uh, few up there, Harald. Uh, maybe we'll take two together uh, and see how that goes. Serious. Thank you so much for, again, three great presentations. Um, uh, Mona, really fantastic. Um, can I uh, just um, uh, basically make one very quick point uh, just to ask um, whether there is a greater relationship to German botanists? into the 1930s, right? Because your guys are German, does this continue to be important? 
as a parallel to Q or maybe more than even Q, right? Uh, and there's of course literature about you know, Zionism's subaltern positioning vis-a-vis -vis German nationalism, so, so, so there would be something to work with here. Um, Martin, uh, I, I mean this is really great, you know, the archival silences. Can you um, say something about, can you tell us in which categorical ways you think these types of silences in a trans-imperial story differ from silences pre-created by archives in a national situation, right? Because there, and there's of course an entire literature on that. How is it different? How does the trans-imperial situation make for a categorical difference, right? Um, and I, uh, yeah, I will leave it at there. Peter, it'd be, it'd be great to talk more, but there are lots of people who want to talk, so well, I'll, I'll exchange later with you, yeah? Can you, yes, please, can you just pass to me, Carl? To me? Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks, yeah, so it follows on nicely from Sirius's last question, and, and it's mostly for, for Martin, perhaps in part to, to Peter also. So it concerns the, 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 the entire relationship between empire or, or imperial history and migration uh, and diasporas, right? So I, I mean, like, like, like all sub, or many subfields, I think imperial history or history of empires has, has a tendency to behave imperialistically. Uh, that, you know, that, that, that more and more areas uh, become part of uh, imperial history. And now I don't have a strong anti-imperialist sentiment in this regard. I, I have nothing against it. Uh, but... I wonder, uh, you know, what 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 what, it, what what the effects are on our understanding of empire and and imperial history, and in relation to migration in particular, it's it's being done increasingly, right? So there's uh, there, there, there's this paper by Lucy Weil recently in in Past and Present, where she looks at Italian or Genoese migrants to Peru, uh, which she then casts as an example of Italian empire and so forth. Um, and and a little bit like like Sirius's question, I guess my, my my question would be, you know, what 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 does how does this change our view of empire and 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 of colonialism? In some ways, it's obvious that the two go together, right? I mean, the the the, the Romance language word for colony famously, you know, has this double meaning of uh, foreign community and. So much so that actually in Romance language, settler colonialism is a tautology. It doesn't work because it's a tautology, right? Um, so, so, so I'm not denying the, the, the connection between the two, but I guess my question is about the effects on our understanding of empire and imperial history uh, when, when we, you know, introduce this whole migration uh, complex. Because after all, as, as Sirius hinted at, right, there's plenty of examples, like take Ireland. Man, not many people think of Ireland, of 19th century Ireland, as an empire. Uh, so there, it's, a, it's an instance of migration history, but the, but the social history maybe is not necessarily that different from Italian immigrants. Uh, so, 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 so what good does it do to migration history or to imperial <laughs> history to think the two together? Please. <laughs> I'll start. I have a relatively quick answer. Uh, thank you, Saris. Um, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm currently uh, focused on the... like spatially speaking, on, on Palestine itself, as, as you know. Um, I do see a lot of um, German experts um, coming to Palestine, not just botanists, it's agronomists, it's uh, um, entomologists, it's, it's all of these people, but I've only looked at them in the Palestinian context. However, um, I would like to also do the reverse and follow um, Warburg, but also the lesser known people, because Warburg has been studied quite a lot at this point, right? Um, I would like to follow them more throughout their networks in, in Germany and abroad because I see a lot of potential there. However, my supervisor, who I think you know quite well, has told me to let this case rest for now um, and focus on actually writing this chapter. So in a future project, I hope I have a better answer for you. This is getting personal. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shall, shall I step in and <laughs> try and diffuse things here? <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, many thanks. I, I will try and answer those two questions together. And actually, it raises, it comes to the question you asked at the end, which is how did diasporas form or disturb uh, empires? Um, I'm going to try and be really quick here, and apologies if I'm jumping over stuff. But I would say that the question of national silence and trans imperial silence are one and the same question because. Um, in the national historiography of Japan, overseas migration has traditionally been written out. These people, you know, don't really exist in modern histories of Japan. Um, and 
one of the things that I sort of had to do with some collaborators in Japan when they wanted to do a handbook was they said, could you do something on rural Japan? And I said, where's your chapter on migration? I'll write the chapter on migration. Um, and so, I mean, the, the, um, and, and this is connected also to a national story in the sense that in local communities in Japan from migrant sending areas, the national institutions, the schools, the temples, the roads, the shrines, and so on, were built with these remittances from overseas. And so there are sort of silences in this national story of the extension or the expansion of the Meiji state, which was, sort of, you know, they were, they were built with the money from overseas. So I think they're two sides of the same story. Now, that then links to the question of, you know, what do we gain by, by calling this migration history a, a, an imperial history, right? I think um, the first thing here is just to have a sort of very quick overview of these uh, entrenched divisions in Japanese language historiography. Um, and they are basically defined by, by destination, right? If you were a migrant and you went to Taiwan, Korea, Manchuria, Sakhalin, you were a colonist and you were studied in imperial history. If you went to Hawaii, Australia, Brazil, North America, you were an emigrant, and that was an entirely different set of, of academic institutions, and those two didn't speak to each other, right? Um, with the consequence, mainly, that the trans-Pacific migrants were again silenced from this story. Um, now, the reason you have to bring them into contact is because all this new research is showing, and indeed I mentioned it just very briefly in my paper, there were these incredibly important contacts between Japanese migrants in California and Japanese migrants in Manchuria, for example, right? Um, building on the work that Louise did. Uh, between Hawaiian pineapple producers and coffee producers in, I mean, Japanese Hawaiian, uh, Japanese coffee producers and sugar producers in, in Hawaii and the development of the uh, Japanese sugar uh, industry in Taiwan, for example, of which, you know, my guy Ijima in the paper is one example. So um, there's... I think all sorts of ways in which we have to think about um, uh, these non-colonial sites of Japanese expansion as part of an imperial Japanese story. Um, and, and, and I think this then also finally goes to the question of language because the, the way in which the term uh, co colo colonial colony colonialism is translated into Japanese in the late 19th century is first a domestic translation. It's to do with Malthusian expansionism. There is an overpopulation at home, we have to send people overseas. So the, 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 the character is increase people, which is shokumin, which is translated as colonialism, right? But then around the turn of the 20th century, that first character is replaced by a homonym, shoku, but with a different reading, a different meaning, uh, which is plant, right? So to plant people, right? And there you see a shift in Japanese, which I think is very useful for us to think about conceptually, between overpopulation at home and the planting of people and, 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 and plants and so on overseas. And I think Japan gives us a great way of thinking through those problems through that linguistic shift around 1900. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, in no, it's you. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> and we'll take uh, Harald Itang, I think. So this was actually mainly a question to Mona, but it has a, a, a cognate with, I think, what Michelle was asking about terminology. Um, there's a structural tendency over time to treat uh, scientific work as part of a larger colonial project and you know, in a kind of power knowledge direction. And I'm wondering whether, in, in the same way as the Marxists once didn't want to overdetermine everything by understanding the state as just an organ of class rule, there's a way to understand at least the relative autonomy of science and scientists. Mm. And I think maybe in your work there's an opportunity to do this where you can distinguish between two kinds of colonialism, if you want to call it colonialism. Um, which I think connects with the question of whether somebody moving across the seas is automatically a colonist or not. So, thanks. Thank you. Can we also just add Harald's question? <clears throat> yeah, thanks uh, for 
three fantastic papers. Again, my question is for Mona. Uh, I'm interested in the issue of language. So um, having looked a bit or uh, discussed with my group the, the position of Swiss scientists around these times who became conspicuous in various imperial projects. So one of their great advantage was their versatility in terms of their linguistic skills. They could publish in French, German, many of them English or Dutch as well. So they, they had this advantage of, of being potentially trans-imperial. So what about your German heroes, Eich and Warburg? So the Tropenpflanzer, for instance, was that read only in Germany and by some, as we have heard, Japanese observers who were trained in Germany? and Or was, was that also received internationally? Was there a flow of knowledge between these linguistic spheres? So were they integrated in this inter international République des Lettres? Or was it a, a very monocultural, monolinguistic affair? That would be number one. And if there, it, could we then see it maybe, if it was monolinguistic as a German hijacking of, of this emerging um, Zionist and later Israeli scientific uh, or biological realm, and how this this developed later on. So, in which languages did they publish? Was there attempts of Hebrewization at some at some point? So, how did this develop in the late in the later 40s and 50s? Thank you. Thanks. No, it's, we'll leave it at that, but there is a lady just behind that for the next round. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Please. Um, thank you very much to both of you for the questions. Um, yeah, so, so Ben, thank you very much. I think <clears throat> I completely agree with you, and I think this also leads me back to something I, I was wondering about yesterday when we were talking about the technocrats. It's not the technocrats. Um, I mean, even with my small group of people, and I would not refer to them as my heroes, but that's just a side note. Um, I hope it didn't come across <laughs> like that. Um, there is so much tension in between them. It, like, among them, they are, they, are, they are discussing how should we, how should we draw up these gardens, which plants should we include, which ones should we exclude. The main, um, the main contention I see here is between, again, Warburg, who is this, like, um, and I, I call it very simplistic, but like this, this support of scientific botany, and then we have his opponent, um, Ephraim Harioveni, who is, has a Jewish education, Jewish religious education, and a botanical education, um, comes to Palestine and wants to recreate um, the landscape of the Bible, because this is the holy land, and there's only one holy land in this context, so, um, he sees the need to really go against um, like scientific understandings of botany at the, at the time and not um, plant the gardens in terms of taxonomy, um, different plants and different uh, natural regions of the land. No, he wants to look back at uh, the holy texts and see how landscapes were described then and then recreate those images in that garden so um, Jewish religious people but also Christians uh, could come and could support um, this project. So this is something I would just add. I didn't have time for it today, but there's really, this is not a homogenous group. Um, yeah, that's my first point. And the second point um, to your, your second uh, sub-question maybe is, I also agree that I don't think that actors, just because they are traveling or mobile, necessarily and directly can be interpreted as trans-imperial actors. And I do think that uh, maybe this, this concept has to be thought through a little bit more carefully. Um, I would have a connected question back to the audience or like a couple of points for reflection as well as, for example, for me, I focus a lot on uh, European metropoles. Is that enough to make it trans-imperial? I honestly don't think so. Um, so that would be my answer to you. And then, um, uh, yeah, Harald, thank you very much also. This is really important. Um, to my knowledge, the Tropenpflanzer was not translated. However, I do think that we have to not see all of these empires in their homogenous kind of language blocks. There were a lot of um, German speakers as well in the other empires, right? Or German, again, experts in quotation marks, um, were employed by these empires and were working for them. So I don't think that the Tropenpflanzer was 
inaccessible to the extent that you might have been hint hinting at. Um, so, and I see like, from the story we heard yesterday uh, from Moritz uh, from Rescues that also this had really uh, a wide readership. Um, I would like to add as well that yes, for, for my community of people that I'm looking at, <clears throat> they, they had diverse backgrounds. They were speaking uh, German, French, uh, Russian, Hebrew, Yiddish, um, all of these languages. And they, they were publishing in the beginning mostly in German. Um, but then, and this is connected to you know, the bigger story of also having a Hebrew university there and the kind of the language wars that were going on at the time, the idea of what should the language be of this newly created nation here in this land, um, were mostly moving towards publishing in Hebrew. Um, an interesting connected point to this is as well, because I was looking at the connections between them and the British Empire um, more broadly, not just through Q. Q. Um, I don't see British officials taking the knowledge that's produced there at the gardens and then incorporating it in their writings or in their research, which again makes it kind of detached and not a part of this whole empire story, which I find quite interesting because they were doing a lot of important research in terms of agricultural sciences, soil sciences. Uh, soil erosion was really big on the agenda at that time in the 30s, connects to the US as well, but I don't see them taking the work that they did there um, on their own terms and then using it in other publications. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions just <laughs> there, yes, please. Thank you so much. And thank you, Peter, um, for your wonderful paper. It's very thought prov uh, provoking. Um, so my question um, has to do with your source, um, your sources. Uh, you said that uh, it's mostly based on Shanghai uh, published newspapers. And, um, and I was just wondering, um, the lack of archival materials, um, you know, to what extent um, does that complicate or the access of archival materials, could it complicate your, um, your story? Um, and can we really derive a, a full picture of what the Qing state uh, was going to do based on Shanghai newspapers, because um, to my knowledge, a lot of these people were marginalized. You know, they were not in the circles of decision making, um, and a lot of that rhetoric is sort of pie up in the sky kind of ideas. And logistically, the the reason that I'm asking this is that logistically, I I just find it very implausible that the Qing uh, state would think about pulling back migrants, uh, which mostly came out of the coastal areas, and then transport them uh, all the way to Inner Asia uh, or to Taiwan. I mean, that, I, I don't think that that's really how the Qing state worked. Um, so logistically, I, I find it very difficult to imagine how that would work. And so that's a question. And my related question to you is um, that to the extent that I'm aware of, the main interest um, of Qing officials regarding the overseas populations is not to see them as a source of labor, but really as a source of capital, um, as some of us have uh, discussed so far, um, as uh, in, in the form of remittances uh, from abroad. And, and this is not a new phenomenon. This is a phenomenon going back centuries. Uh, and one could ar argue that um, the overseas funding was uh, quite instrumental in the uh, financial economy uh, of, of the coastal areas. And so this is not to undermine your point, but to complicate the picture a little bit. Could you pass the microphone behind you to Jaja? I think she's been, yeah. Uh, well, for, she was long time since. Thank you, wanted to say something? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question to ask uh, uh, Dr. Peter. And uh, uh, the question, the first, my first question is, uh, to what extent, uh, in your research, the empire or imperialism you refer to, uh, those Chinese intellectuals' imagination, uh, colonial ima imagination, is rooted in the traditional Chinese uh, Confucians, uh, Tianxia world will, or it is uh, come from their uh, encounter with the Western colonialism and uh, imperialism. Uh, because as far as I know, I think many Sinophone historians, they are quite reluctant to call the Qing as an empire, and they would rather would rather to call it as a Tianxia state. And my second question is, uh, as far as I know, I think the, the intellectuals in Shanghai, most of them, they are Han Chinese, and uh, uh, 
uh, they, ins they have been influenced by uh, you know the Western capitalism or, or Western colonization, and uh, uh, so the the so called uh, overseas colonial or uh, uh, expedition in your research it. If they want to build up an empire uh, still controlled by the Qing ruler or Manchu ruler, or it is an empire they want to build based on the Han majority. Yeah. Peter, do you wanna? Uh, Can I just? I, I just. Okay. I have one thing point to sort of add on to um, these these two previous questions, and this is to both Martin and Peter. And I, I just wondered if you could both kind of comment on some of the really remarkable similarities and, and resonances between the discourses and, and strategies and, and kind of instrumentalities of, um, and, and impacts of, um, of overseas migration, but specifically in terms of the remittance issue, which Martin, you're raising that really for the first time. People have not talked about the importance of remittances for Japanese migration, but of course they have a lot in the Chinese case. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. And then the Malthusian argument, which has been raised a lot in the Japanese case, but um, Peter, this is the first time I've heard somebody you know, talk about the importance of that discourse for Chinese migration. So I, I think it would be interesting as a kind of, you know, and can we talk about the, the um, maybe intellectual exchanges or is, is this just a commensurability or, something that, that is um, because of uh, East Asian uh, sort of statecraft, uh, how do we understand this, um, the way the Chinese and Japanese states are thinking about, about migrants? Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take these. Uh, if you want to react. Peter, maybe, uh, you go first. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for these excellent questions. Um, let me try to handle them in the, in the order they were raised. Um, uh, was it uh, Jenny who raised the first couple of questions? I can't really see the audience that well, but um, I agree uh, uh, with both of your points um, in terms of the problematic nature of the archive I'm using to tell this story. Part of it is simply the fact that uh, the, the paper that I've written for this conference is a kind of minor offshoot of something that I found while working on my book project. Um, and I was, in that book project, I was interested in, in discourses and practices around um, Chinese settlement in the Northwest frontiers in the late 19th century. And, and in the process of telling that story, I came across these sources, which are very much located in, in uh, Shanghai newspapers with some additional sources here and there, um, which describe really a kind of imagination of what could happen, but certainly not what the Qing state was planning to do or what even could, could take place given the financial constraints uh, on migrants uh, and on the Qing state itself. Um, so you're, you're, you're very correct to say logistically this was um, uh, unlikely to happen. The reason I'm interested in it is because, um, first of all, it opens up the kind of Pacific world to become a question in relationship to the far kind of inland frontiers of the Qing. Um, in the way that Martin, I think, described for kind of the kind of disciplinization of different destinations, uh, in, in kind of for Japanese migration, I think the same has held true uh, for thinking about overseas Chinese migration, where uh, those who focus on migration to the Pacific world are very rarely in conversation with those who focus on migration to the kind of Qing internal frontiers. Um, and so the, my reason for reading these sources, uh, fantastic, and, and, and though they may be in kind of not really reflecting reality is because they help to kind of discern the ways in which um, elites were imagining some of those connections. And for me, it, it, it's curious because it offers a way uh, through this kind of uh, act of, of rhetorical commensuration in their writing to um, articulate what they thought um, the Qing Empire should be doing in the late 19th century, even if uh, that wasn't necessarily the case. 
Um, and so logistically, you're, you're, you're completely correct um, to suggest that it would be, it would be difficult to imagine um, very poor migrants from the southeastern provinces who were traveling overseas to be, get, be, be redirected to the northern or northwestern uh, frontiers. Certainly, um, migrants as a source of capital, again, more important um, in these decades than uh, migrants as sources of labor for these frontier territories. So, so again, I, the discourse that I'm analyzing here doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of uh, on the ground or the even the aims uh, and policies established by the Qing state, but rather, it, it, again, it opens up questions about how uh, Chinese elites are thinking about uh, colonialism, uh, even if it doesn't necessarily materialize through Chinese migrant labor right at the time, but maybe later, later on, and, and certainly decades later, uh, very, very much into the 20th century. Um, in terms of the question regarding uh, uh, whether or not um, Chinese uh, leaders are, or elites are using um, Chinese terms or Western terms to think about uh, colonialism, this is also a, an important question because certainly up to the very end of the 19th century um, in Chinese discourse, they are often relying upon Chinese terms and when they're situating uh, late Qing colonialism within a kind of longer span of Chinese history, they're very, very much focused on, uh, they're very much using kind of uh, allusions to past historical Chinese episodes and using Chinese uh, terms to describe what's happening. And then, you know, starting in the first decade of the 20th century, they begin to appropriate more kind of translated terms drawn from the Western historical experience to kind of describe what is happening. Um, and so I, I'm in this paper in particular, I'm not so caught up on the terminology itself, um, but rather, again, that, that the way in which um, elites are focused on the dynamics of frontier colonization or colonial development, uh, particularly in the Americas and the ways in which they imagine that to be not so much different from what, what should take place um, in, in the state and having that analogy be a kind of suggestion for, for how they understand uh, Qing colonialism. And then, of course, in this period, uh, you, you raise the question about um, Han colonialism versus, versus a kind of Qing imperialism. And here, the, the way I'm uh, kind of approaching the, the, the topic um, and what I find in the sources is that uh, Writers are very much interested in, in seeing the kind of development of Qing colonialism through uh, the movement of Han Chinese people. In fact, that is the uh, one of the major mechanisms that they understand has to take place for the Qing Empire, even though it remains you know, kind of a Manchu-led empire, to uh, substantiate its rule in those outer territories. So. Uh, Han Chinese colonialism is, is a kind of centerpiece of that late Qing strategy. Um, I'll, maybe I'll stop there and let uh, uh, Martin jump in, because I know part of the qu last question was for Martin as well. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, Luis, um, I, 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 there's lots, I think, that um, is very interesting about this and that also still needs to be done. I and mean, one of the things when I was reading Peter's paper and hearing him speak is that um, in some ways this call for what might, one might imagine a sort of refocusing of Chinese migration foreshadows this sort of call in the 1920s in Japan to, to refocus from North America to the, to the formal colonies, right? So I think that would be something to, to talk about, Peter, at some point is sort of... Um, you know, is that something that actually Japanese uh, intellectuals are looking at sort of to the end of the 19th century, the Qing Empire? I, I simply don't know. What I think is very interesting, and I, I, I do know a little bit about, um, I mean, just as on a linguistic thing, the, the term for the soldier settlers in Hokkaido, Tondenhe, uh, is of course a term from the, from the Xinjiang um, frontier. Um, so there's a sort of ling linguistic overlap there that I think is very interesting. The Japanese policymakers are looking to the Qing expansion uh, westwards as they model uh, colonialism in Hokkaido. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that um, 
on the one hand, in, in Meiji, mid Meiji intellectual thought, you've got this movement away from Asia, this, this famous idea, you know, that Japan should leave Asia, should throw in its its lot with European countries. And yet, the same people who are kind of making that argument, particularly Fukuzawa Yukichi, who's a very famous journalist and intellectual, he's also praising the Chinese. Not the state, but he's praising the migration mentality. And later on, Tokotomi Soho, who's a very, again, a very famous intellectual and, um, and journalist, right around the time of the Sino-Japanese War, as he's articulating a discourse of Japanese expansionism, he's saying our model should be these expansionist Chinese merchants who go all over the place, and you know we, the Japanese, are not expansionist enough. And if only, you know, we hadn't been closed for two centuries during the Tokugawa, you know, we would have as many millions of Japanese overseas now as the Chinese do. This is right as Japan is going to war with China. So I think there's all sorts of sort of interesting ways in which the Qing, uh, it, the Qing Empire, is still providing a model discursively for Japan, even at the moment that Japan is, in military terms, overthrowing the Qing Empire. And that sort of still need, there's more work that needs to be done on that. OK. Um, uh, we started late, so we still have uh, just uh, time for two last questions. Mohamed and uh, yes, please, you first. Um, my question is for Monica. Um, I, in listening to your to your talk and in reading the paper, I, I think I wanted to understand a little bit more of how you're dealing with the role of the British, um, particularly like when you talked about Q and the connections to this botanical garden. Um, you know, I wonder if you can think in terms of these questions we've been talking about of commensurability in that we're not maybe likely to see the types of investments because this is a mandate. So why invest in the botanic gardens in the way that you would in col colonial botanical gardens, right? There's a, an end point in sight of when the m mandate will expire and maybe that that might be something to think about there. Um, and then um, in the paper you make the distinction between quote unquote practical Zionists um, versus these botanists. And there too I wonder if Maybe this is maybe I think about it a little bit differently then from the earlier question about um, science being distinguished from empire in certain ways, but because there's a, again a very a real power relation here with Hebrew University, right? I mean, and the fact that people can be on the ground and have the space to envision and create their imagined version of what Palestine is, um, and so, and, and I'm also curious there where you where you talked about. Um, that Christians could be involved in this project. Are, they, are these Christians in Jerusalem? What about the Muslims in Jerusalem, right? I mean, if so, are there practices of knowledge acquisition, like the kinds of things that we see in the sort of conquest of land and then conquest of labor arguments, you know, in other agricultural settings? How do the botanists relate to those larger projects? I mean, maybe those, those are just things to, to think about if you do pursue this in the future. So, that, but thank you for the, the fascinating paper. Yeah, thank you so much. A question to Mona as well. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering about the extent to which these botanists take into account the local knowledges. Uh, because the pictures that you show are so impressive. I mean, it's so, I mean, so violent in terms of imposing a landscape onto this, uh, onto, this, onto this land. So what about the local knowledges and about the local ecologies? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, both of you, for the important questions. Um, they are kind of related. Um, let's see if I can uh, go quickly, but thoroughly. Um, <laughs> Yes, so I think the, the, the way I presented today is also a bit of an outcome of my, my whole thesis because I'm looking at four different case studies and in the two first, which are what I call land reclamation techniques, um, ideas of the British of um, ori uh, environmental orientalism, uh, focusing especially on soil erosion policies and the role of um, uh, Arab nomads and, and their animals, especially um, the goat, I think here we can see um, a, a difference how the British deal with these types of things and um, the botanical garden. They invest 
a lot of money and a lot of efforts into, um, and this is the British, into um, looking into um, soil erosion policies. How do we make the land uh, more productive? How do we make it greener and so forth? This is also in agricultural terms, right? And the same applies to forestry. And I think um, like the, the whole uh, narrative around um, forestry um, in, in Palestine is, is, is uh, more widely known. So here I make the difference between those two case studies that I have where I see extensive British uh, involvement financially, but also through, um, through um, the studies they do, um, they are very involved, and then this. So for me, that was more like the, the difference between those uh, becomes maybe more clear when you, when you see the whole, uh, the whole picture. Um, and then, um, I think what you, yeah, so the, in my paper, and thank you for reading it, um, I make the uh, distinction a little bit between more practical-minded Zionists and botanists, agronomists, and then Warburg, on the other hand, who is really focused on scientific education in the terms of university education. Um, and here, um, the main argument is that they were all belonging to a group that was by contemporaries called botanical Zionists. And uh, by contemporaries, this term was meant a little bit like, okay, they're just dealing with plants. I mean, we can't really take them seriously. What about our political ideas, our ideology, and so forth? However, uh, in, in, in recent literature, this has been, um, the term botanical Zionist has been kind of, you know, used, has been used a bit more neutrally to refer to their work as actually being really important. Um, the main criticism towards Warburg and his colleagues who were, um, in, a, in a way, very elitist. Warburg was a millionaire. Um, Warburg was very involved also in university um, politics. And that all, I think, fed into also um, how he was able to set up all of these things. And the main criticism against them uh, was by, um, for example, Wilkanski and others who said, hey, um, we are coming uh, from a Europe where we are disconnected from the land. And now, basically, you are disconnecting us again by bringing us back to the university, but not making us um, work the land. Um, and this was like the main, um, this was one of the, the tensions that was there as, as well between, between the practical, what I call practical and scientific um, botanists. And I hope that makes it a bit clearer. Um, when I refer to Christians, um, no, this was American Christians. Um, <laughs> there, were, there was a tour by, um, Ephraim Haraveni, who was this uh, proponent of biblical botany, um, he went to the U.S. and was um, holding lectures and talking about his um, garden of the prophets and sages that he wanted to establish in Palestine. And basically, this was uh, a tour of public relations and funding, I guess. Um, so in this context, he didn't take uh, into account the local Christians um, in, in Palestine. Uh, and this connects to, to the last point, uh, which is one of also my main arguments in the chapter, but it doesn't really relate to trans-imperial connections, so this is why I didn't mention it today. I see um, two areas in which um, local Arab Palestinians play a really important role in, 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 in this story. Firstly, um, the whole question of land, and I pointed out to you where the botanical gardens were. This was a very intricate uh, uh, endeavor to actually um, get the land. And there were lots of uh, different negotiations around it, uh, but during those negotiations, uh, what Magnus, the, the president of the, of the Hebrew University, said he was negotiating with the British Mandate government was um, there were some ideas, but then, you know, um, the, the lifter Arabs were kind of in the way. And I find a, a quote in, in, in my sources that actually says, yeah, but we don't really care about the lifter Arabs, we care about our garden, so please make it work. So one of my arguments is that um, expropriation of land was really important in the story as well from local um, Arab Palestinians. And lastly and secondly, local knowledge, of course, existed. I mean, um, the, the local people had the best knowledge about their flora, right? Um, Ephraim Haryoveni, who was working on the biblical botany side and who was a bit sidelined by the <coughs> others, was actually only one of the group who spoke Arabic, um, who established a museum uh, that was open to everyone in the community and also made connections to uh, local Arab Palestinians. He did so um, because he thought that these people were the stewards of the Holy Land. They had been there since um, you know, um, the Jewish people had to leave the land. And this is why they were the ones if you imitated their knowledge, you would, could kind of recreate old knowledge of biblical times. 
So he was the only one who was kind of more in, in, in touch in a way with local knowledge. However, first of all, because he was sidelined by the, by the other group um, at the university in his garden, never actually came into, uh, into reality. Um, and because he did not incorporate any of the local Palestinians into actually working on the land, he just, or on the garden, he just um, took their knowledge and then went with it. Like on his American tour, there was no Palestinian with him who could like talk about these things. So I think it is important, first of all, the land question, and second of all, the sidelining of the local knowledge as well. Yeah, and thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Mona, and thank you, Peter and Martin, for excellent papers and a great discussion. Please, you need to come to the front <laughs> for the photograph. <laughs>